Okay, good evening, everyone. It's um, just five o'clock. Um, so we can begin our session um, today, this evening. Uh, with, as usual, we'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who, by the light of the Holy Spirit, did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant by the same spirit, and be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, for the same Christ our Lord. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Again, um, first thing, the, you'll find the notes for um, this evening's session in the chat if you have not received it by email. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to be looking at the vestments which are used at mass and depending on how time goes we may actually get to the ministers um, of the altar the reason the reason i'm doing this is um for you to get an idea of the church's worship the liturgical um conditions under which we worship because there's nothing in the in the church that is there um by chance the holy spirit has been guiding the church these last two thousand years from her inception so that she might offer to god in christ a perfect worship the kind of worship that god uh, requires in order for his grace to flow freely for the salvation of all those who are called which is in fact everyone we can already see this in the Old Testament, where God is very precise in the instructions that he gives uh, Moses and Aaron and his sons how they are to worship him, you know, to the minute, they to wash their hands and wash their feet, that they, they, um, they cannot just walk in and out of the sanctuary, that they have to observe um, ritual laws continually. In, uh, in other words, the priest at the altar needs to keep in mind that he is in the divine presence. And the same applies, of course, to the laity. We need constantly to be reminded that we're not in a circus or a theater, but we are in fact in the divine presence. We are like Moses on Horeb, looking, gazing, wondering, marveling at the bush that is on fire, but does not burn. You know, um, and what is the Lord's command? Take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. So wherever the Lord is, is, is a sacred place, a holy place, and we ought to behave accordingly. So we're going to be looking at the vestments. Um, last week, if you recall, we, we looked at the church um, itself, the building, um, its origins, shape, um, and we really had to scan through this because we were talking about 2000 years of history. So, and um, I'm focusing on how it was um, in the beginning and the slow, gradual development. So it's there's never been a case of, of created liturgy. Liturgy is something that God gives to us and we respond. Um, so having said that, this introduction, hoping that the people um, are in, the, we will begin with sharing of, screen, of my screen and um, the the notes what's on this what will on the screen is essentially what you have in in um, your notes so the okay the, the first thing that we need to, to recognize is that um, there, for public functionaries, you know, judges, um, police officers, lawyers, um, acad academic professors, 
there is a special dress um, the, and the use of special dress for public functionaries is really in full accord with human nature. And we find this is a very common practice everywhere we go, among nations, societies, civilizations. So whether it be something like the feathers of the Red Indians, the Native, Ameri Native Indians of North America, or the Aborig Aborigines of South America, the Maoris, the, the Pacific Islanders, or so on, we find that when it comes to a public function, there is a formal dress for it. You know. um, what else do we notice? We notice that the higher the official, the more elaborate, the more striking is the dress. <clears throat> for instance, you may be familiar with the dress of the mandarins in Imperial China. You know, they or the <clears throat> or the emperor in, in Japan. So as I was saying that um, the, the 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 garments, the costumes, the um, dress of officials is always um, very elaborate, and the idea is to impress. So the higher the office, the more splendid we find the uniform. And the in the Old Testament we have God himself giving a description of how the high priest, Aaron, and his sons, how they were to dress when they appeared in his presence. And so we'd have, for instance, the, um, the, the tunic and then the, the various garments on top of that. Um, his head also had to be covered. So there was a headdress to go with it. Um, we find all of this being described in Exodus 28 um, in the, in the um, Old Testament. For us as Christians, the church has simply copied what is done, what was done in the Old Testament, but more important, what is done by human nature, what human nature itself recognizes ought to be done. So in prescribing certain investments for the priests and other ministers at the altar, the church is essentially wants us to understand that the priest does not act in his own person at the altar, but rather is acting as the representative of Christ. And there are passages, passages in the gospel which will tell us that much. So um, the, the idea we need to understand is when a person acts in an official capacity representing the state or the, the people in general, um, he, this, this person takes on the, the persona of the state. You know, so in, in the case of a judge, he is standing in the place of the state. He's, he's acting as a state for everybody in regard to some case, some um, law, law dispute, legal dispute. And so also for the um, priest, He's the one who goes to God from the people and goes to the people from God. And we read that in the, in the um, letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest is taken from among men and so on. Since the priest goes to the altar in the service and in the name of the Supreme Lord, it is therefore most becoming that he should appear robed in the most becoming manner. And that's how it used to be. Um, and in the Eastern church, it is, they, they were the most spectacular um, vestments. So where did the vestments come from? What is the origin? Well, the first thing is we, we know that the, the vestments come from the time of the apostles and from the early ages. How do we know that? Because the vestments that the Catholic clergy, priests and deacons wear, is similar to that which the Orthodox wear, the Orthodox clergy. And the Orthodox broke away from us a thousand years ago. It's the same to that which the Eastern churches wear, the Oriental churches, and they, they broke away 1500 years ago. Um, it's the same as we find among the, the um, older churches, um, such as, and those have been separated from us, such as the um, 
the, the, the Christians in India, for, for instance. It's the same kind of dress. So that tells us that it must have a common origin. So the vestments used at mass, they were not prescribed by our Lord, but by the church over the course of the centuries. And the church had to be very careful to, to avoid two extremes. So the vestments worn were not um, from the Old Testament priests, the Jewish priests, because they, they recognized that there was a break. And secondly, they had to avoid dressing like pagan priests. So there would be confusion. So what did they do? They developed the vestments developed from the secular dress of the Greco-Roman world with modification being made to these over the centuries. So essentially they would have gone to, they would have taken the vestments, no, sorry, they've taken the clothing, the ordinary secular dress of the world, um, but they would have chosen, of course, the best and the most important as we do for Sunday, we have Sunday clothes. So we choose the best. And because the society and culture is always changing, secular dress changes, but the church retained the, what was then secular dress. Um, so the priest then having, is, is going to be dressed in those garments. So the first thing he does is to wash his hands. So before vesting, the priest dressed in a cassock, Okay, um, washes his hands. And this is an ancient custom at all times, all nations, that ministers of the altar, we find this in Jewish as well as in pagan temples, they wash their hands and feet before offering sacrifice. We have the Muslims, for instance, before they pray, they wash their hands and their feet and their head. Um, in, among Hindus, we have the priests again, we have this washing before. Um, for us, as, as Christians, the washing, we only need to wash our hands. And in the Old Testament, the washing of, was specifically um, requested. So we have, for instance, in Exodus 30, the Lord saying to Moses, you shall make a, la a lava of bronze with his base of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, with which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. See how serious it was. They shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. It shall be a statute for them, even to him, to Aaron, and to his descendants throughout their generations. So this washing was clear. But it, it's not the bodily washing that is important so much as the spiritual. The, the, we, we, we are a, a compound of spirit and flesh, soul and body. And so what we do with our bodies is in fact a reflection of what we are doing to our souls. So as we wash our bodies, we wash our souls. By the act of washing his hands, the priest is reminded of the purity that should adorn his soul when ministering before the Most High. And so the priest prays whilst he's doing this washing, grant to my hands, O Lord, a virtue that shall cleanse away every stain so that I may be able to serve thee with a clean mind and body. So here we have the two things being drawn together, brought together. It's a cleansing of, of the soul from sin, the body from, from dust. So having done, having washed his, his hands, um, it actually is a, it's a point of interest. Our Lord going to, to, to be to, uh, to Calvary, um, the, his last appearance in the court of Pontius Pilate, what happened? Here we have Pilate washing his hands almost as, as if 
Pilate himself was the one sacrificing our Lord. So, okay, so having washed his hands, the priest now um, would, would go to the um, bench where the vestments are laid out. And the first vestment that he puts on is the amice. The amis is a rectangular linen cloth that he briefly places on his head before wrapping it around his neck and shoulders. The amis comes from the Latin, that's a surprise, amicere, which means to wrap around and being originally covering for the head and neck was worn like a hood. And we still have that in the religious orders. For instance, the Dominicans, they still wear a hood and the, the amis will go um, over, they put the hood on and then the amis and then it falls back. The, the same for, for the um, other religious who, who have hoods. So the, the, what does the amis represent? Essentially the cloth with which the soldiers blindfolded our Lord as they struck him. There's a prayer associated with the amis. Um, place upon my head, O Lord, the helmet of salvation, so that I may resist the souls of the devil. So the amis is also to remind the priest that he, his mind needs to be focused on the Lord, and so not to be distracted um, by the temptations that the devil um, is likely to bring. So, so you can see the amis, it'll, it'll go over the shoulders, it tucks into the collar and it's tied around the waist. So having worn the amis, he's not going to wear the alb. Now the alb is a long white tunic from neck and shoulders down to the ankles with long sleeves. It's also, it's a reminder of the white robe in which Herod, arrayed our Lord in mockery. When Pilate sent our Lord to Herod because he heard our Lord was from Galilee and um, Herod was the ruler of Galilee, he sent, and Herod being in Jerusalem, he sent him to Herod and Herod was hoping to see, as St. Luke tells us, some miracle. But our Lord said nothing. He was silent in the, course, in the, in the court of um, Herod. And so Herod dressed him in white and mocked him. So, when put in on the alb, the priest says, make me white, O Lord, and cleanse my heart, that being made white in the blood of the lamb, I may deserve an eternal reward. So again, the idea of cleansing comes to the fore when we, we put the alb on, just as we do for the Amazon the washing of the feet. Sorry. Um, now the alb is, the alb comes in many different styles and um, here we see an alb with lace. Um, the, the body of the alb remains linen. Linen, of course, as we, we said before, represents the passion of our Lord, but it's decorated sometimes uh, around the hem sometimes the sleeves as well, and sometimes both. Um, it could be decorated with embroidery, it could be decorated with lace. Um, and there is a reason that lace is used, because it's, as you look at the, the lace, it reminds us of what? It reminds us of a fishing net. And the purpose, and you'll usually find that bishops um, would wear laced um, albs, because they are the primary fishermen. They're the ones who are to haul in the, the, um, the, the catch. And so that's one of the reasons that lace is used to decorate the Alps, to remind the bishop that he is in fact a fisherman, a fisher of men, human beings. Okay. Around the, to, to keep the, the alb together so that it doesn't <laughs> trip up, the um, priest, um, it has to be tied around the waist. And the cord that's used to tie it around the waist is called a cincher. Um, it's again, the, the cincher, it, it, it can be plain or it, can, it could be 
it could have tassels on it. Um, the, the tassels just prevent it from getting tangled up in, in the, around the waist. Um, makes it easy to, to pull on and off. It's decorative, of course. But again, we think of the Jewish priests whose vestments had tassels and bells on it. And in the Eastern church, the, the bishop still wears tassels with bells. So as he moves, there's this tinkling sound. The, the um, cord, the, the cincher, calls to mind the cords with which our Lord was tied around, um, was tied with, read that in Mark's gospel and John's gospel. And the prayer associated with it is, good me, O Lord, with the cincher of purity, and quench in my heart the fire of concupiscence, that the virtue of continence and chastity may abide in me. So again, a reminder of the priest of his obligation to observe chastity, um, and also a reminder that he, in fact, is like our Lord preparing for his passion. So all of the prayers focus a great deal on the chastity of the priest, which, of course, um, to today, on, on, unfortunately, the, the prayers are, are seldom said um, anymore, and we've well seen what, is, what the result has been. So, so we can have the, the cincher in various colors uh, to, to suit the feast day or the, um, the, the, the mass that's been offered. So it could be green, red, uh, white, violet, black. Right, on the left hand, the priest wears a maniple. It's an ornamental band of silk, silk, usually the same fabric as the chasuble, we'll come to that later. It's worn over the left arm and it's the vestment proper to the sub deacon and it's worn only during mass. So it's a mass vestment. Um, the others we mentioned, the, the um, well, the cassock is ordinary dress for the priests. Um, the amice is used um, at mass. It could be used, for instance, at benediction or another service. Um, the alb must, must be worn at any other liturgical service. Um, and the cincher is necessary to keep the alb, alb in place. But then the stole can be used at any of the liturgical functions. But the maniple is unique. It, 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 like the chasuble, the maniple is worn only during mass. Originally, it was a small towel or handkerchief worn over the arm by servants. Although we also have people of rank who carried them like um, handkerchiefs, but again, always in the left arm. Its name comes from the Latin manipulus, meaning a small bundle or a handful. The maniple is a symbol of servitude and of the cares of this world and reminds us of the chains with which our Lord is bound during his passion. So for instance, at the beginning, if you have high mass and you have a deacon, subdeacon, the, they do not wear the maniple during the asperges, the priest of the dressing, stole and cope, and, but not the maniple. After the asperges, they will go change, and then they will put on the vestments of mass, which um, means the chasuble and the maniple for the priest. Okay. Since the maniple also means a sheaf or bundle, the priest is reminded that he must not appear in God's presence empty-handed, but that he must bear the fruits of virtue and good works. So the, there's an even heavier obligation on priests than there are on the laity. Um, in as much as the priest is responsible, not only for his own soul, but also for the souls of those who are over whom he has care. So putting on the maniple, the priest prays, may I deserve, O oh Lord, to bear the maniple of weeping and sorrow in order that with exaltation, I may receive the reward of my labor. 
is labor among the faithful. We, we think of um, St. John Vianney, who used to weep over his people, you know, because they were so stubborn and, and hard hearted. And his tears, you know, brought about their conversion. According to the Psalmists, they went out and wept, casting their seeds. But come in, they shall come with joyfulness, carrying their sheaves. The stole. The soul is a liturgical vestment in the form of a long band, which is placed over the shoulders and crossed upon the breast. Its name is derived from the Latin stola, which has a distinctive, which was a distinctive garment of the Roman nobility. It's a sign of authority. The stole signifies the yoke of the Lord, consisting of the burdens of the sacred ministry. So at the ordination service, the bishop imposes a stole upon the candidate saying, Take upon you the yoke of the Lord, for his yoke is sweet and his burden light. The stole is essentially uh, the, the, the garment of priestly authority. And so he's going to wear it whenever he's carrying out a liturgical function. So whether mass or baptisms, any of the sacraments, whether he's preaching um, or whether he's visiting the sick, the, he wears the stole an indication of his priestly authority. The stole also signifies the nuptial garment of grace and represents immortality. When put on the stole, the priest prays, restore to me, O Lord, the stole of immortality, which I lost through the transgression of my first parents. And though I approach unworthily to celebrate thy sacred mystery, may I merit nevertheless eternal joy. The, for the priest, he crosses the um, stole uh, on his, uh, his chest, so the left side goes on the right and vice versa. Um, that's to indicate that his authority is limited. The bishop, however, wears the stole hanging down because he has the fullness of, of, of uh, power. And over all of these is the chasuble. It resembles a little house, the Latin word for little house is casula. Uh, over the years, the sides were gradually cut away to make the garment more practical. As, as we well know, the, um, the wealthier a person is, the more um, he displays his wealth by his dress. Um, and um, the chasuble, the, it, it, as a secular dress, the, the, the chasubles were very elaborate, but as a liturgical vestment, it has to be practical as well. And so the, we look at the older chasubles, they were very full and heavy, and these were trimmed away to make it more practical. So we, today, we're, more, we're familiar, I suppose, with the older chasubles, that is what's called the Gothic chasuble, as opposed to the Roman chasuble. The Gothic is, is broad, wide and um, it hangs sometimes over, all the way down to the ankles whereas the roman is more compressed like a violin case it's been described <coughs> and reaches perhaps as far as the knees <coughs> the back of the chasuble is usually ornate with a large cross embroidered upon it a reminder of the cross which christ carried to calvary the the um, chasuble, the Roman chasuble, since we're speaking about the Roman rite, the Roman chasuble um, has various designs. Us usually there's a cross on the back. Um, it may be just outlined or um, it may be embroidered and you can actually have the figure of our Lord or, on it. And the front is usually a column. So the back reminds us of the cross that our Lord carried to Calvary. And the front, the column, reminds us of the column in which he was scourged. Um, sometimes it's reversed. Um, the chasuble is also remind, a reminder of the purple garment which Christ wore in, in the portrait of Pilate. Um, he, he, he was being mocked, the soldiers in fact dressed him in a, in a 
a purple garment. It's sometimes said a red garment, a scarlet, because the, the two colors are very similar. The bishop who invested in a newly ordained priest with the chasuble says, receive this sacerdotal garment by which charity is denoted. When the priest puts on the chasuble before mass, he prays, O Lord, who has said, my yoke is sweet and my burden light, grant I may so carry it as to merit thy grace. The, um, the chasuble represents charity. And so it's placed over the stole to indicate that all priestly authority should be practiced, should be exercised with charity. Um, there, there's been a, a tendency recently, uh, not so recently, but a tendency to wear the stole over the chasuble. And of course, we can see it's immediately symbolically what is being done, what is being said, namely that priestly authority trumps charity that we must obey um, under all circumstances, even it means um, putting away charity, which of course is quite contrary to the Christian and indeed to the mind of the church. So when the church gives us, um, I'm speaking about priests, when the church gives us um, um, our, um, order in which we wear the vestments, we ought to do so because there is deep mystical meaning behind what is being done. The Roman chasuble is smaller, stiffer, and it's less flowing than the Gothic chasuble. The, the Gothic chasuble gets its name from a period in history, the Goths, who were the Vandals, the, the, the ones who came destroying everything inside. Um, but the, they eventually settled and they became, um, they set up um, kingdoms for themselves, the Visigoths. They were in France, in Germany, they went down into Spain, across the Mediterranean to North Africa. We said when the priest is about to celebrate Mass, he wears a cassock. The cassock is, in fact, the daily garment of the priest. It's a common garment of all clerics. So it's usually black to signify they are dead to the world. So that's the first thing. The religious orders can allow a little more liberty. They wear not the cassock, but they wear um, the, the, um, their habit, what's called their habit, which depending on the congregation <coughs> can be simple or to <clears throat> more complicated. It could be a more complex or the color can differ as well. So we have, for instance, the Dominicans who wear white. You know, we have the Benedictines <clears throat> who wear black. We have the Franciscans who wear gray um, and, and, and so on. <coughs> so the color can vary. The, in, in our region, because of the heat, we have a dispensation to wear not black, but white, because, simply because of the heat. So I'm sure you recall that the priests of the 50s and beyond, they were black. Okay, we said that the, the chasuble is, is strictly a, a garment to be used for mass. It's not to be used for any other liturgical service, such as baptisms or funerals. In fact, even at the funeral, the requiem mass, the, when it comes, uh, once the mass is ended and it comes to the final commendation, the priest ought to change into a cope. The cope is another priestly garment it's used during the asperges, the sprinkling before mass or benediction. It's also used for funerals. Um, it, it can be used for baptisms. It's a flowing robe and it has a large scarf or a humeral veil, which is used if in the case of benediction, it's used to grip the monstrance. Um, it's used in processions. Again, the cope um, is very elaborate and you can see that it takes its form from the Chasuble is just a chasuble where the front is opened. Um, and this it has a clasp to, to hold it together across the breast. So the cope can be 
it can be used during the asperges, it can be used for processions, um, for, for benediction, funerals, um, baptisms, and so on. We said there was a veil associated with the cope because the veil is long. Um, it's, it can be up to four, five, even six feet. Um, it goes across the shoulders, and so it's called a humeral veil from the shoulder. But other things in the church are veiled. Um, in fact, the most sacred things are veiled as a sign of the mystery that um, is present. So we begin with the tabernacle, which is veiled, as indeed are the other sacred vessels. And the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament also was veiled. Okay, so the Ark was in the tabernacle and there was a huge veil in front of that. Out of respect, the faces of the dead are covered, they veiled. The first stages of life are hidden. So there's a veil there as well. Our Lady, the most blessed vessel by which our Lord has made flesh and dwelt among us is never seen without a veil. The, then, to the best of my knowledge, there are no apparitions of Our Lady without a veil. She's always veiled. God created woman to cooperate in the sacred mystery of bringing new life into the world. And St. Paul, um, in I think it's Corinthians, he speaks about the necessity, necessity of women being veiled as a sign of respect. The, the respect is that they are women are a sacred a sacred mystery, and the mystery is in fact in childbearing, because they it is in the womb of the of a woman that God brings a completely new creature into existence. So the womb is a divine workshop. So the tabernacle veil can be. Simple or elaborate, depends on the shape of the tabernacle. Now we speak of liturgical colors. Um, as, I, as I said before, the, there's nothing accidental or coincidental in the church. So the colors that are used also are important. Basic rule. All the inner vestments of the priests are white and should be of linen. And they are intended to remind him of the inner purity and innocence of heart, which he should never put aside, but should always preserve under a cloak of charity. The outer garments, however, the chasuble in particular, may be of varied colors. The chasuble signifies charity the root and the parent from which all the other virtues spring. Um, St. Paul in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians tells us that even if we do the most incredible works of, of, of um, mercy, even to the point of martyrdom, if we do it with our charity, it's nothing. So charity, in fact, is that great virtue that will save us. In fact, it, we, we must love God above all things and our neighbor as, as ourself. So charity in itself embraces and manifests all kinds of virtues, even as the resplendent light of the sun diffuses many rays of all colors. And so we have the, the various colors, green, okay, white, uh, purple or violet, and uh, black and red and rose. These are the six colors. And um, the when are they worn? Well, the seasons of the church and the special feasts are each associated with one of the five colors. Um, rose is excluded because it's only worn twice a year on Gaudete and the Atari Sundays. So they're basically, they're five fundamental colors. So the feasts will um, determine which color is appropriate. So these colors are divided from, sorry, these colors are derived from the traditional colors used by the Jewish priests mm -hmm. in the temple, each one with its own symbolic meaning. So we look at the colors individually. 
Okay, the white is um, where we begin. White is sometimes replaced by gold or silver, and it represents, symbolizes purity, innocence, rejoicing, and light. Okay. So for that reason, it's employed throughout the Christmas and the Easter seasons, because those are Christmas and Easter, the two most important feasts of the church. It's also worn in the Feast of Our Lord, such as the Transfiguration or the um, uh, you can the Annunciation and so on. Also on the Feast of Our, Our Lady, the Feast of Non-Martyred Saints. Um, so that would be the doctors of the church, the fathers of the church, etc., who are not martyrs. It's worn on the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul, um, St. John the Apostle. Um, to St. John the Apostle for two reasons. Ordinarily, because he's an apostle, he he, the vestment should be red, but because one is he, he is a virgin and he was not strictly martyred, um, white is chosen. Plus the fact, of course, the fact that he is um, within the octave of Christmas. Although remember that the Holy Innocents so also in the octave, but for them we were red as we do for for the, um, the feast of Saint Stephen. And John the Baptist, um, for his uh, birth, for June 24th. It's also worn, white is also worn certain ceremonies such as weddings and baptisms and the burial of children. Um, for the children, um, a case in point, if the child is, is baptized but has not reached the age of reason, then we wear white um, because the child is in heaven. And Secondly, you can also bring the, the, the coffin of the child into the sanctuary because the child, as I said, is in heaven. We don't know that for anyone else who's, um, who's, who's, um, who has reached the age of reason. White is also worn during the consecration of churches, altars, and bishops. Okay. Red. Um, is symbolic of blood and fire. And so it is worn in the feasts of the precious blood in July. It's also representative of the Holy Ghost. So it's worn on at Pentecost and the octave, throughout the octave of Pentecost. And it's also worn for the Feast of Martyrs, the Evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and um, the Apostles. Green. Green is the color of nature and of life. It denotes hope of eternal life. And so it's worn um, from the 14th of January right through. So the, the 13th, of course, is the, the, the um, octave of the, um, the epiphany. So from 14th is worn right up to Septuagesima Sunday, that's today. Um, that that's, this is ninth week before Easter. So Septuagesima is the Sunday that falls within um, 70 days of Easter. And then it's worn from the first Sunday after Pentecost, right through to the Saturday preceding the first Sunday of Advent. Um, Advent is, will then wear purple. In, in the Gothic um, chasuble, um, you, usually you, you find that there's a, a um, panel that runs down the back and, and the front, which is decorated. Um, again, it's usually, the modern ones, it's usually some symbol of our Lord. So you can have the Cairo, the Alpha, the Omega, or you can have the wheat and the, a bunch of grapes. Violet or purple. Violet symbolizes sorrow and pen penance. So it's a garment of penitence, grief, sorrow for sin. It's worn during Lent and Advent, 
and certain passion masses, the blessing of ashes, the ember days, and the other penitential occasions. And here you can see that the this is a Roman chasuble. Um, this one just has the, the bar, um, the column, where our Lord was, uh, on which our Lord was scourged. Black. Um, black represents mourning and death. It's worn on Good Friday and for masses of the dead, requiems. Um, it was, um, it wasn't abolished. It was um, just ignored, it's like the maniple. It's an option. Um, and so we, after, after Vatican II, the black was simply quietly replaced with, with purple. And then it fell, it just disappeared after that. Um, mm -hmm. The same thing for the maniple. The maniple was optional and then that too disappeared. And then the last of, of them, <clears throat> the rose. Um, the rose is optionally used in place of purple only twice a year, Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, which is basically the middle of Advent, when the third candle of the Advent wreath is lit, and Litare Sunday, which is the fourth Sunday, again the middle of Lent, where rose symbolizes a muted joy in the midst of a penitential season. So in the Ungaudete Sunday, it's the high, high point before the, um, the, the, it, it represents a joy because Christ is close. He, his, his, um, his, his presence is, is imminent. And similarly for Letare Sunday, the, the focus is now on our Lord's passion that's coming, the great sacrifice he's going to offer of himself for us. Here you can see this is a picture of a, of a Dominican. He is he's where he has the hood, so the amice is wrapped around the hood. He's wearing a Gothic um, chasuble, um, and you can see the, the 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 column is very thin, so it's basically to give shape to the vestment. Uh, how can you tell that it's a Dominican? by his hands. Um, the Dominicans pray with the palm of their hands parallel to their chest, whereas the Roman, um, well, secular priests pray with the, the hands parallel um, to each other. And apart from that, he has a tonsure. So, so again, the, the point is that the, the, the rubrics on how a priest should stand, hold his hands, hold his body, his posture, and so on, are uh, very uh, uh, strict. And the, the idea is that the priest is acting not in his own person. He, he's not free to, to um, be creative or to, to um, do his own thing. He is doing the thing of the church of Christ. And so he's not to make, he's not to draw attention to himself, but rather to the act, to the action that he's performing at the altar. Um, as we well know, when, when the priest becomes the center of liturgy, then all hell breaks loose, anything can happen. And um, you have people who are happy and those who are unhappy. But if he does what he's supposed to do, then we can all accept that this is what the church wishes. That that does not that that that's not to imply that that most priests do it deliberately. They, they simply do not know. So the litur the other silver and gold, strictly speaking, are not liturgical colors. Um, that, that is not obligatory, but because um, of um, the, the the greatness of the feast or the occasion, um, then you want to brighten up what we already have. And so silver and gold vestments are added. Um, so silver may be used instead of white, um, 
uh, obvious reasons. And gold denotes majesty and splendor. And it can gold can replace green, red, and white for additional solemnity. Um, silver is frequently used for the masses of Our Lady, um, quite appropriately. Um, the, uh, this, this is a picture of, of a very ornate um, chasuble. Um, not quite sure how you classify it, gold, I guess. But, but again, if, if you were to study it, you'd find that a lot of the symbolism contained there comes in fact from the canticle of canticles, you know, the, the various plants there. So, so, so again, it's a matter of knowing the scriptures, knowing the liturgy, and understanding the iconography or the, the symbolism that's being um, portrayed. Excuse Father. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing a screen. Do we have a screen? Um, I am not seeing one. I don't know. I, you don't see it at all? I do. No. Can you okay. see the screen? I see it. I see, see the screen. It. Well, I see it. Yeah, I see it also. I guess it must be like Hoshu. Right. Okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I'm seeing it as well. Okay, um, the liturgical colors continued. The following um, must all, the, the following um, vessels and veils and so on must follow the prescribed color. The antipendium, which hangs down in front of the altar, um, it should, it must have the color of the, um, of the day, of, of the mass that's been, uh, the so this this is a cloth that hangs in front of the altar. Um, the, that cloth, the anti pendium, is only necessary if the altar is relatively simple. But if the altar, the bottom of the altar, is elaborately um, carved or displays some um, symbol such as Last Supper, it need not be covered. The tabernacle veil, certainly, the tabernacle should be covered. The chalice veil, the chalice should be covered. And with the chalice is a purse, um, like a purse, in which the corporal is, is placed. The chasuble, stole, maniple, cope, humor veil, and others, the dramatic and tunic worn by Tegan Subdeacon at Solemn High Mass. Um, all of these must carry the prescribed color. All other vestments aren't made from white linen. Okay, um, I think, right, we, we six here. So we end here um, and carry on next week. So there, there, there will be an, another set of notes to come, but we'll deal with the sacred ministers. That is the priest, deacon, subdeacon, um, and how they, are to, to celebrate the sacred liturgy. This will take us into the kinds of masses that um, are offered, the low mass, the Mise Cantata, and the solemn high mass. We'll talk about the differences um, between them and, um, and, and move on from there. So hopefully next week, we, I, I think we'll end with all of the, the, uh, the things around the mass, and then we'll go into the actual rite of the mass um, the week after, please God. Um, yeah, so I, what, what I hope you, you've had so far is an idea of the mass in its origin, simple, in, in as much as it was the Last Supper, but it was directed to um, the passion, the sacrifice our Lord would offer on Calvary. It brought together what was offered in the temple. Some of the things from the temple flowed into the mass naturally, but others was the, the, the work of the apostles and the church. The idea of the mass is that Christ is the one who offers it. 
um, the priest acts in this person. The idea is the offering made to God is Christ himself, made by Christ himself to his father, um, begging for the forgiveness of um, his mystical body, all those who are in his mystical body. Um, and so we, we are all um, in Christ, we're one in Christ, offering a perfect sacrifice to God our Father. So having said this, I will take a few questions. I hope they're going to be easy questions. Good evening, Father. Uh, good evening. Sorry, but... Yeah, good evening. Oh, good evening, Father. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the stool. Yes. Now, I have gone to confession already where the priest does not wear the stool. Is this a, like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it, it affects the confession to the point, but I mean, the fact is that the stool is a, such an important vestment for the priest to wear. Yes. No, it will not. It will not affect the the um, sacrament, but it certainly is going to affect the the priest because he has an obligation, as far as possible, to wear a stole. Um, yeah, but but the it depends on the circumstances. If if it is in a public place such as a church, the obligation is serious. He needs to wear a stole. Um, and that is for the protection of the, con the, the, the person confessing. Because as you know, it's, the, the priests often don't dress as priests. And you know, you go in, how do you know it's a priest that you're confessing to? You know, so th that, th that is in general. If, if it's, um, uh, you know, less formal. You know, if you're if you're you you're going to um, you, you meet someone a, a priest on the road, they ask you a priest. Yes, yes. Then you you can um, uh, the, the store. He doesn't have a stall. Then yes, but but essentially he ought to wear a stall. Yes. But is this something that that was um, lost in in the training in a seminary or something? Well, why is yes. it that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Father. Good afternoon, Father. Good I afternoon. noticed that in some of the masses that I attend, uh, especially on Marian feast, that the priests sometimes wear, wear, would wear blue. I, I, I can't recall if I've seen it in the traditional Latin mass. Uh, can you speak a little bit about Marian feast and the color? Where, where's blue? Yes, Father. Um, yes. The there is a dispensation given to the Carmelites at Aylesford to wear blue. But um, ordinarily, blue is not a Maria, it's not a liturgical color. Um, but the Carmelites certainly have that um, dispensation, and they can include anyone who who is a tertiary, well, a priest who is a tertiary of the of the the Carmelites, but it's it's some, it's something that um, again it is it, it's everything's got so loose, free and easy that it's um, difficult. Thank you, brother. The there is um, no, I th I think it's only the Carmelites in the Eastern Church. They they do use blue. Uh, although I'm not, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure for which um, feast, but probably a Marian feast. Any other questions? Father, how many um, colors in the, in the Pope is there? Um, I know they body black, white or gold. Is there any other color that is used in the, in the Pope? Do you use it for the other liturgical yes. colors? Yes, it's, it, the corp can be made in any color, any liturgical color. So, for instance, you have a black corp for uh, um, requiems. 
So when you receive in the body or for the final commendation, um, you have a, a red cope, for instance, a Pentecost um, or Palm Sunday, um, for the blessing of palms. Uh, a green cope, an ordinary time, uh, white for Christmas or Easter. Um, and um, for solemnities of Feast of Our Lady, you can wear white, uh, silver or gold. Okay. But as Thank I said, you. silver and gold, uh, just to, to, to elevate the feast, to show its importance. Thank you, Father. Mm. Any others? No. Um, Father, the, the modern day priest, the older mm. mass, masses, yeah. when they're vesting, they're supposed to say these same prayers, or I mean. Yeah, yes. The, well, the prayers now have become optional okay <laughs> yeah but 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 again um the, I mean, the, the, this is what the president are required for for those who celebrate traditional right it, it's ob obligatory and not not only that the before mass um the the priest is also obliged to save some part of the office so it's not the case of jumping out of bed and running this into the sacristy but he is obliged to, to spend some time meditating or um, praying before attending, before celebrating Mass. So um, this might be the, the, the result of not following these things, which result in less, you know, sanctity, reverence. Yes? Yes, because we are, we are compound creature. We, we cannot separate ourselves um, if we if we do not <laughs> and so we need we keep we need to keep our minds on on what we we're about to do and some, sometimes it, it is indeed difficult because, um, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you outside of a traditional parish, if you start to, to, be, to put these things into, into practice, people think you are standoffish or, you know, strange or something. And so it, 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 you're almost coerced into, St. Gregory the Great complained of that be, before, um, he was a monk, and he he lived in the monastery, and he was very careful in what he did, and what he thought, and what he said, and so on. When he became a pope, you know, he complained in one of his letters. He said, "No, it's conversations which I wouldn't even dream of having. I now have to put up with. Otherwise, I'm going to lose the the people. You know, they they like children. You know, you just." Um, have have to 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 try to bring them up to a higher level, um, but and and not crush. And so Saint Gregory himself complained about it. There there used to be a practice of, of saying the rosary before mass, simply to get um, people disposed for the for the sacrament. And that I mean that is something that can be done. So we don't have this chatter. Um, before mass, you know, or and the same is done after mass. That that um, so you, again, you don't have the, the so instant disconnect. Um, Father, you mentioned that no apparition of our ladies without a veil. Not yet that I've I know. Seen, yeah, yeah. Yet I I see you know sometimes you have um, so pictures of our lady or statues without a veil. So is it that we have to be careful about these images of Our Lady that, you know, it could bring some sort of, you know, um, disrespect or so to, to her if she's always has her head covered? Yes, I, yes, it should be covered. 
because she is the most holy, the most sacred being, you know, um, created being, I mean. Um, so she should be covered. Um, the burning bush, in fact, is, is regarded as a type of Our Lady. A, a, a type is uh, an image of her, inasmuch as the, the bush, God was um, in the bush, the bush was burning, but the bush was not consumed. And in the same way, God was in her womb, and she was not consumed by the deity. You know, and since Moses found this to be sacred ground, you know, we also should think of her as that burning bush, that sacred ground, and have every reverence for her. You know, it's it said that demons, the devils never blaspheme her. They will say the, 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 the most blasphemous things about our Lord. But when it comes to Our Lady, they're utterly silent. They say nothing. It's left to us to blaspheme her, to disrespect her. And, and this is from Exorcist. Um, Father Moth um, said so. And um, even Padre, Padre Pio said the same thing. Father, you mentioned uh, Moses taking his shoes off before the burning bush. Yes. Uh, why don't we take our footwear off uh, when we enter the sanctuary? Um, there used to be a rubric, actually, in the early church. And there is, is on, um, I think it's Holy Thursday and, and Good Friday, the the clergy are required to take their shoes off on those two days. But um, the, um, I think that those are all that, that remains of that tradition. Thank you. In the in the beginning of the missal, there's there's usually a, a, a several pages which give the rubrics and for the various um, ceremonies, and there are other books, of course, which describe in detail the ceremonies of the church. Um, Fortescue, perhaps, is the best known. Okay, if there is nothing else, we can end. Any more questions? Going once, twice, thrice? Okay, thank you very much for thank your you attention Father. and participation. Thank, thank you, Father. Father. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, so, Father. Thank you very much, Father. Very thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she can and keep by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, free for us in the now, the hour of our death, amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for, for us in the now, now and at the hour of our man. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst, amongst us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord's with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary, Mary Mother of God, God, pray for us in us now. And at the hour of our death, amen. amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth to beseech you, Lord, Lord, that grace into, that our, hearts. into our hearts, that we, that we be to the incarnation of Christ's son, was made, known, was made by known by the message of an angel, made by his passion of the cross, the glory of his, his resurrection, to save Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And, and may the soul of the faithful heart in the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen.
May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, descend upon you, remain with you now and uh, always. Amen. Amen. Okay, have a blessed week, everyone. Yes. Blessed you, Father. Thank you, Father. Have a blessed week. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone.